Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. It's Roxanne Durhage of Authentic Living with Roxanne. Thanks again for tuning in this week. Uh, this week, I have two special guests, uh, Gabriel Krenza and Robert Krenza, uh, and they own Black Wolf Consultants, Inc. And men, I should say guys or men, thank you for coming on today and uh, sharing the time with us. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having us. So I often say, you know, we're all talking about transformational leadership, but I, I think it's something that um, even more so there's need to discuss transformational really, um, leadership in this time, uh, well before the last uh, bit that we've been through, but even more so I'm thinking that individually, collectively, as a person or just uh, whether you're a CEO or the person um, at the front of a company, everybody's looking for transformation and have for a while, but now it's come to bear that we're, we're needing it. It's not a nice to have anymore, but we all need it. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, your company and um, kind of, kind of what was the beginning point when uh, you decided that uh, starting this company was something that you wanted to do. Uh, one is uh, why transformation and why is it so important now in Black Wolf Consultants? Um, let, let me start with the Black Wolf Consultants piece because the two are connected. And um, Black Wolf Consultants uh, really came into inception in about 2013. Mm -hmm. um, prior to that, I'd spent 20 years as a corporate consultant traveling around the world, uh, doing global consulting, um, anything from uh, executive coaching one-on-one uh, -on -one work to uh, teamwork uh, to large corporate groups. Um, I left the, um, uh, the, as an independent contractor in 2012 and started Black Wolf in 2013 because specifically I thought that there was a really uh, important gap uh, in um, organizational development work and organization development transformation and individual transformation. Mm -hmm. So Black Wolf was, was created uh, specifically for uh, the purposes of providing or presenting uh, a transformational program uh, to corporate America, to corporate world. Um, Black Wolf um, started out as Krenza Leadership Strategies and I got a lot of feedback very quickly from clients that I'd worked with for years, um, really um, challenging my choice. And I chose Black Wolf Crens uh, of Leadership Strategies because I was nervous uh, and uncertain on what to call the company. And um, uh, after the feedback, uh, I um, said to my wife, uh, who is also working in Black Wolf Consultants, um, what, what had just occurred. And I asked her for some guidance in how I would name the company. And she said, why don't you do what you always do, which is meditate. And so um, go within um, and ask uh, for help uh, and support on what I wanted to call the company. And uh, the Black Wolf uh, has been a totem of mine uh, for more than 30 years. Mm. And um, I was doing a lot of Native American studies um, uh, 30 years ago and came to understand that the totem was a spiritual guide uh, that you could ask for help uh, at any point that you needed it. 
And when I asked, how do I ask for my totem? I was told, you ask for your totem. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what I did. Um, and literally the black wolf uh, came into my meditation um, within several minutes um, uh, as though it was waiting to be asked. Um, what I came to understand uh, over the years was how valuable the black wolf totem was uh, in helping me guide uh, my own life path. Black Wolf Consultants, when uh, I, I was sent a book called The Hero and the Outlaw by Carol Pearson, uh, by a client who I had worked with in the Middle East and was doing marketing work with me. And I read the book and it talked about the importance of embracing the archetype of the um, uh, of what your company stood for. Hmm. So uh, it's no wonder to me that the Black Wolf really came into um, my meditation very quickly. And it became very clear that the archetype that the Black Wolf was really representing was really twofold. And this is what Black Wolf means. Black Wolf means bringing light into times of darkness. Hmm. So it really is the iconic symbol of the wolf howling in front of the moon. That's what that means. It means bringing light into times of darkness. Uh, the other symbol of the black wolf is the pathfinder. The other archetype of the black wolf is, is pathfinder. And the pathfinder uh, really represents this unique uh, ability that the wolf has, which is that it's never lost. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, of the um, qualities of the wolf. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that, that's a separate conversation and really needs to be addressed and is important to be addressed. Um, and we're addressing it um, as we do our work. So that's the name of our company. And, you know, we have, um, you know, about seven consultants working for us globally. And we're a global consulting company focused on transformation. So it's, isn't it interesting that you went safe uh, to name the company and then you went inside to find what should have come naturally from you, from you. And uh, uh, with most, most of us, when we're making a major decision, yeah. it's either based on fear or, or on love, right? Like to kind of go to that space and you went inside and you were able to kind of, um, you know, what a, you know, what a, great name, first of all, but the symbolism behind it is, is actually kind of breathtaking when I think about leadership and, you know, the space that you have to go into to create that leader within yourself in order to shine the light on the path as you go. So, Gabriel, tell me a little bit about you and uh, when you got involved in the company and um, what it's been like working with your dad. I feel in some ways I've, I was in indoctrinated into this line of work uh, at, a, at a very early age. You know, I have uh, very clear memories of sayings like, um, you know, you are your word and, and, and do what you say you're going to do when you're going to do it, um, which really holds true in our work, uh, you know, with executives around the world. Um, and so there's there's a lot of kind of very simple learnings that I was brought up with that are naturally, uh, you know, just kind of ingrained in, in this work. Um, so when I decided to join Black Wolf just about five years ago, it was a very um, kind of graceful and ease-filled transition for my career. Um, you know, I, I, my academic background is in sustainability and um, both my undergrad and master's work. Um, I worked for the Natural Resources Defense Council for um, a half dozen years on uh, environmental policy and food systems change. And during that time, I started to become more and more involved in um, strategic supply chain and operations uh, for raw material sourcing, and and um, I decided to go back to 
uh, school and get my master's of business administration. Um, great program out in San Francisco. It was focused on, um, it was, a, it was an MBA in sustainability management. Um, so very focused on the lens of a uh, triple bottom line, you know, people, planet, profit, um, kind of looking through that lens when approaching big business decisions. And um, after I, I graduated from that program, uh, you know, my father, Robert, approached me and, and said, hey, you know, do you have any interest in, in doing some work with Black Wolf? And I I kind of chuckled and I think I kind of muttered, um, yeah, that's not, you know, I don't, that's not the type of work I do. And kind of the other parallel is my background guiding uh, in the wilderness, you know, for the National Outdoor Leadership School. I've been a senior instructor there for a dozen years. And, and, and that's, you know, talk about transformation. I mean, you take teams of people out into the wilderness for 30 days at a time and they come back um, completely changed and forever impacted. And so, you know, when Robert approached me, I was like, well, you know, I thank you. Um, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a different trajectory and, and our work is, is not very similar. And <clears throat> I think I, you know, kind of wanted to respectfully humor him. So I, I took on, I think I took on a little writing project um, and shadowed uh, a, a consultant at Black Wolf, uh, Burke Miller, and um, you know, kind of like saw the process of him working with a team and engaging one on one and one on many, and and I kind of had this uh, almost epiphany moment where I was like, uh oh, okay, this is a this is exactly what I want to do, and and um, and so my approach to the work is much more experiential in kind of how I, um, my offering to Black Wolf. So I, I create experiences for executives that are, I would say more out of the box, um, taking folks outdoors and, and um, you know, this idea of uh, wilderness immersions, taking people um, kind of, allowing them the opportunity to unplug in order to reconnect with themselves and each other. Um, and yeah, I couldn't be more grateful to, to do the work and I continue to learn. It's a, um, you know, it's a culture of curiosity and, and humility. I think the other piece I want to mention is how you introduced us. We're both men. Uh, we're, also, we're also both white men. And I think the, the gift that we are very conscious about giving is, um, you know, how to, be, how to be in contribution and how to really be in service given the privilege that we were born into um, and, and kind of fiercely working towards kind of uh, deconstructing the stereotypes that... Um, you know, rightfully so, we're so well known for. Um, so, yeah. So it's not amazing the synergy, right? Even that's the alignment, you know, like the, when, when you go in, in, in a place of deepness, like you were going mm -hmm. on your path and I have a 20 year old. So Gabriel, I can, I, I, I chuckle when I think <laughs> about uh, his, his path and what it, where it might lead him. Mm -hmm. And, as a parent, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to listen and hear that you found that spot you were, and then, you know, it, it kind of led you back. I'm going to use, you know, to some of those basic core fundamental values that you've been mm -hmm. learning probably since you were crawling around and then you're able to, to give that gift back to the world. Yeah. So I want to talk about the overall concept. You know, it's so funny because I didn't look up the the meaning of Black Wolf and I'm actually kind of glad I didn't because just hearing that really um, illuminates a place within me. Um, and I, as I think about leadership, because, you know, I became a leader quite young. I think it was my early 20s and um, running um, clinics at hospitals and you are often rudderless as, you know, whether it's young and I would say an age at this point, but some, some leaders are just in that, that space where they're, they're trying 
and they have they're they're not malintentioned, but sometimes they get lost. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of the the overall kind of early area view of transformational leadership and kind of some of the things that you offer at, at, at Black Wolf and it helped me understand how you work with companies and leaders um, and how you decide where where they fit in, in reference to some of your offerings. And whoever wants to answer, that's good with me. I'm just, um, just going to take a, a, a beat to pause and uh, speak about you know, my son and a little bit of his history and really just in, in, in a short period, I came, to, and this is connected to your question. I, I came to understand in the eighties, uh, the importance of human beings transforming, human beings that were born into a belief system, um, really not being given the uh, option or the awareness, even being aware that there is a choice that they were born into. Um, so when I was in my 30s, I came to understand that I could choose and that was fundamentally my responsibility to choose. And what I came to see was uh, to choose inclusion versus exclusion. And, and I, I know that's a, a little vague at the moment, but inclusion, literally including the community called the planet Earth. And exclusion uh, is a, a model that um, a lot of us have been born into um, and aren't aware that we are living from an exclusional place or a place of uh, not being open to ideas, other ideas, other concerns, other considerations, other values. Um, and so that, that, that would be the distinction. And the 80s and 90s was filled with, and I lived in New York City at the time, um, programs, processes, teachers that were really uh, quant qualified later as the human potential movement. So there was a huge movement, um, I guess I would also include the decade of the 70s, 80s and 90s into um, the question, who am I? Mm -hmm. It led me naturally into the, um, the transition from adolescent to adult and how important that question is to fundamentally lead the rest of your life from. And what I also came to see was that a parent couldn't do that for the child. Mm -hmm. That the child uh, needed to be mentored um, in a very uh, different way, in a way that the, that the parent didn't even consider, um, primarily because we had the role called the parent. You know, we were protecting them. So if we continue to protect them, they would never really be discover who they are. You know, they'd be defined by the parent. So Gabriel um, went into a program called Northwater's Langskeeb when he was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And he has been on, and I'll let him speak for himself, many different adventures and expeditions uh, since he's 14. And that is, Gabriel, how old was that? 20 plus years ago, 20 years ago, right? 23 years ago. And I'm, um, Gabriel is clearly his own man <laughs> um, and makes his own choices and chooses his choices. Um, and I'm very proud and honored that he chose to be a part of Black Wolf. There's a lot more that goes into that, but you know, that's, that's really um, talking a little bit about Gabriel and a little bit about mentoring and parenting. And I would say fundamentally, how do we move beyond a self-centered experience into a kind of global inclusional experience? Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of our adolescents are really, who have now moved into the 30s and their 30s and 40s and 50s and even older, and they're operating from a self-centered experience rather than an occlusional experience. 
And what I'm seeing now, trans, trans, um, you know, take you know, take that arc into the transformational work. My understanding and my belief is that our beliefs drive our behaviors, and that fundamentally is what transformation means. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, what transformation means is that if we have disempowering behaviors that we want to change, in order to change them in order to transform our disempowering behavior, we have to understand, we have to do the work of understanding what our beliefs are that are driving that behavior. And typically what occurs is that disempowering beliefs are really identified and transformed into empowering beliefs. And consequently disempowering behaviors are transformed into empowering behaviors. So what it is that you are having and what's naturally occurring is choosing your beliefs and behaviors. We human beings want to be inclusional. We don't want to be exclusional. And so what, what is occurring as a result of that is this sense of freedom within a context called, who am I? So this who am I question is really fundamentally the most important first question that we human beings can be asked or ask ourselves. And who I am or who am I really is connected to who am I being? So it's really connected to the being of who you are, not the doing of who you are. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of who, uh, who am I, what fills the space and what we're enculturated into, and I'm talking globally now for the most part, particularly in the developed countries or countries that aspire to be developed, there's, there, they are, and I'm gonna use a, a, this word very um, carefully, but very consciously. We're trapped in a model of doing in order to have, in order to be happy. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've learned, and, and you asked the question, how, how do I, how does Black Wolf decide who to work with? By asking them and listening, mm -hmm. which is really foundational to our work. Why do you want to do the work? Well, you know, I want to uh, sell more ad space. Uh, I don't think I really want to work with you. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, well, I, I want to create a better strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a strategic guy. Absolutely, absolutely. Because I think, you know, if we think of the time that we're in and the leadership that we're seeing, unfortunately, let's talk, look on a global, look at what's happened with, you know, with you in the US or just a global perspective of the world. I often say, you know, everybody's on tilt. And then you have some leaders that are saying, absolutely, we want change. We want transformation in name alone. And then there's ones that really really want it. So not the trajectory of here's my mission, here's my vision, you know, this is where I want to be. Um, but how does that all fit? Because I'm going to think people are going to come towards you like they come towards me to make change. And then as you start to delve further, and you start to get the key metrics of what's happening organizationally and the things that needs to be changed, then you get a a different kind of perspective. Well, it's all well and good. We want to make some change, but we're really not looking for that, you know, real, what I call second order change. We're looking for some change just to kind of look good to the marketplace out there. There's sometimes a very, a very gentle bait and switch, you know, it, and, and I think that term notes a lack of integrity, but the integrity piece is really what we're focused on. So what you just mentioned is kind of transactional change. You know, we want to we want to do this and uh, kind of transactional strategy, right? Mm -hmm. you know, we need to build, we need to uh, ramp up our our widget building, and uh, to do that, we need to be inspired. We need to inspire our employees. And I I've noticed with clients past that you know, the lens with which we do our work, it's like, um, you know, trying to describe uh, a color that's never been seen. 
And how do you do that with a client that doesn't, you know, currently have that spectrum um, on their, you know, in their palette? So what Robert just said, you know, we want to work with people that want to do the work and that are, you know, excited to do the work. But I think um, kind of at, at the most basic level, we want to work with people that are curious and there's a level of curiosity and willing to play, right? Like, you know, are you, are you committed to um, having some degree of imagination about what's possible? Um, or, you know, are you just going to hire us and, and tell us what you want us to do? And if that's the case, nice to know you. <laughs> so let's talk about imagination. I hadn't thought about that. So I'm curious because I know you do some pretty interesting things. Yeah. Just talk about the concept of imagination. So I'm a, you know, I'm a, you know, part of a senior leadership team. I know we're, 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 we're committed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not thinking imagination. So explain to me how, what that process is like and what might you be doing to potentially start to introduce people. I'm going to think it's a bit at a time. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, all of a sudden they go from, you know, one state into an, um, you know, a playful state. How do you kind of start to introduce the concept of, of imagination in some of the things that you might do? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, imagination is the precursor to innovation and everyone wants to innovate today. You know, that's like such a hot topic and, you know, how to disrupt in the market through innovation and, you know, how to how to evolve products and and so usually that's kind of the that's more of the selling catchphrase you know we'll do yeah, i'm gonna innovation. put uh, you're not gonna do a search for creativity but you're gonna look for in innovation or disruptors mm -hmm. uh, potentially when people are coming to you they might come with that perspective and really at that point you're kind of going through the process and they start to recognize that it's in fact getting to that creative space that will get get them to achieve their goals. Yeah. So one of the one of the kind of services that I've put together and, and gotten to facilitate CEOs of you know massive companies around the world is it's a day long or it can be a couple days. Sometimes it can just be an afternoon activity that um, involves it involves a lot of strategy and it's almost like a geocaching exercise. If you're familiar with what that is. A wee um, bet. A wee bet. <laughs> kind of, it's like a scavenger hunt. Yeah. Cause it could, don't the, you know, the kids, I'm going to age myself yeah. here, play that with Pokemon go or something. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. It's kind of, that's my extent kind of, of it. Has, <laughs> well, then you kind of know, but yeah. I built, what I'll do is I'll build a course and it will be, Ooh. um, it can be in a public park, it could be in a national forest, um, it can be in downtown Boulder. We've done them in downtown Boulder. And, um, you know, there's all these kind of virtual and physical clues, and it's a game. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a game, but the activity really is a proxy for how these people work together. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm a bit, it's my generation. I'm a bit averse to team building. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a team building activity. It's a kind of culture building activity. And what really at the end of the day, again, it's that, it's that proxy that parallels how they interact. And if you can distract them enough to think that it is a game and they can let their walls down and uh, they're, their true colors shine, so to speak. You get mm -hmm. very fascinating things coming out. And, 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 and one of the big topics of this, you know, you kind of, if it's a, if it's a team of 12, you'd break them up into small groups of three so that they have more uh, opportunity to interact. And uh, one of the major themes that comes out is, is what's the intersection between collaboration and competition? And so you get these, you know, small teams of three and they all want to win, but of you don't course. really, you don't really define what winning is. You know, the rules are very uh, interpretable and mm -hmm. similar to the marketplace. You know, there's different uh, leverage points within, 
within the markets that are unseen and not all the rules are unwritten, right? Not all companies mm -hmm. play by this code. Um, the code needs to be defined. And so typically the after, after the activity, you know, the after action review or the debrief is where major, major themes come out. But mm -hmm. that imagination piece uh, really comes into play because they get to define what winning looks like and do they want to collaborate as one large group to kind of unlock the puzzle, so to speak? I mean, the course is huge. It can be, it can be a hundred points of, of space. You know, it's kind of like an expansive world. It sounds and like then, fun. It sounds like it's fun. fun. Yeah. Leadership at, you know, it's leadership <laughs> at play. You know, yeah, it's, it's absolutely. Who doesn't want to have fun at work? And I think that's oftentimes what's lacking because it's like, let's do the SWOT analysis. Let's do the internal, the external and, <laughs> you know, all those things. But what I hear here is that you're reaching somewhere with within their space and, you know, all roles aside or you kind of understand how they how they deal with differences or how they problem solve or how their personalities in, would interact with each other um it sounds it sounds like a really fertile space whatever that space gets defined as like you said for people to really um drop their guard and come to some you know probably a lot of realizations i would think as an overall team as well yeah i think what's um I think one of the most heartbreaking uh, you know, dichotomies or binaries um, in, in corporate culture is that there's, that you have to be two separate people. You know, you, you're, your, you're your work person and you're the person when you're out of work. And I think that it's leading to a lot of um, upset and depression at work and, and people, uh, you know, the, the idea of, um, uh, you know, just not being able to be your true self and, uh, you know, imposter syndrome um, because you are, you know, you, you're pretending. Um, so mm -hmm. this play and imagination sparking space when people get to, you know, and it's not your typical offsite where you're at a fancy hotel in some retreat room and then you share a meal together and, and, you know, then go off to your separate rooms and do it again the next day. And, um, you know, how do you really share in a lived experience together where, uh, you know, work is not defining who you are, you get to define who you are. Well, it sounds, it sounds, it sounds lovely. This was such a great interview that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. Be sure to tune in next week for part two, so you don't miss out on the amazing content. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.